Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CircuitPython Weekly Meeting for September 16th, 2024. It's the time of week where we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. I'm Jeff, and I'm sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython, which is a version of Python designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. CircuitPython development is sponsored primarily by Adafruit, so if you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython, consider purchasing your hardware from Adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython dev text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. There is a shared notes document that accompanies the meeting and recording. You can contribute to this document beforehand. The final notes document will include timestamps to go along with the video, so if you're watching after the fact, you can skip right to the part that interests you the most. The meeting tends to run up to an hour, so we think that's an important option to offer to people. After each meeting, we post a link to the next meeting's documents, so anytime during the week, you can check the pin messages tab in the CircuitPython dev channel and add your notes, your hug reports, or status updates. And um, so the meeting is held in five parts. Next up is community news, where we take a little look at the weekly newsletter that Anne prepares for the community. Uh, after that, we have the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka, where we look at statistics, mostly from GitHub, to monitor the health of the project. Uh, following that is the first participatory section, Hug Reports, an opportunity to highlight the awesome things folks around us in the community are doing. The fourth part is status updates. We give everybody a chance to talk about what they've been up to since they last uh, joined us, and what they hope to get up to in the near future, such as over the next week. And then the final part, which uh, only happens if we have topics, is called In the Weeds. If we need to have, a, to have a long form community discussion, this is the time and place to do it. And that covers how the meeting will go. And with that, I am excited to get to share with you some community news. First up, we have uh, like a research oriented uh, item. That uh, the headline is stretching the possibilities of soft robots with flexible electronics. Professor Rebecca Kramer Botticlio and a team of researchers have developed complex electronics that can stretch substantially beyond their original shape. Further, the system can be easily adapted to different uses. And there is a link to uh, science.org there. Uh, and as a demonstration, they developed a stretchable version of the Arduino and embedded it in soft robots. There's also a more, uh, I, I assume, like general public oriented version of this story in techexplorer.com. And thank you, Tim, for putting in those links. Next up, we've got a project called a tactile AAC board. It is a 160 phrase snap dome button symphony for nonverbal communication. It is foldable, spill resistant, and CircuitPython powered. The portable version also has a neck strap. Speech tech meets absurdly practical design, and there's a link to Hackaday and X. And the final item that I picked out is an, from the section New Notes from the Adafruit Playground. And I haven't looked at this one myself, but the picture just got me. I think that may be a museum picture. But the project is called Orrery. Put a solar system in your pocket. And there is a link to the Adafruit Playground. So this is from our community member, Mr. Klingon. Thank you, Mr. Klingon, and everybody else who is sharing projects and notes on the Adafruit Playground. There is a lot more in the newsletter, but what newsletter is this, I hear you ask? Well, the Python on Microcontrollers weekly newsletter is a community-run newsletter emailed every Monday. Uh, it's CircuitPython first, but we also like to highlight the latest Python and hardware-related news, including MicroPython and Python. So when, it, when I say community run, uh, Anne edits this thing and puts it together into a great weekly newsletter, but uh, you can also contribute news stories that you're aware of, and we've got at least three ways you can do that. First up, you can directly edit next week's draft on GitHub, because like so much Adafruit does, we are doing this in the open, um, and it's collaborative. And so check out the link in the notes doc and submit a pull request with your changes. You can also email cpnews at adafruit.com with your hot tips. And finally, on the socials, you can tag a post with hashtag CircuitPython, and we kind of do a best effort at picking those all up and incorporating them. And uh, so besides telling you about how to submit to the newsletter, I should also tell you about subscribing to the newsletter. 
If you go to adafruitdaily.com slash category slash circuitpython, you can find all of the back issues ready to read in your browser. Uh, if you'd like to get it in your email, go to the front page of adafruitdaily.com to subscribe. We only send you the newsletter that you've selected that you're interested in. We've got a couple of other newsletters like IoT, which is a monthly newsletter. Uh, it's not tied to your Adafruit account, and we just generally want to respect your privacy. So we encourage you to sign up. And if you don't want to sign up and get email, we encourage you to go read it weekly on adafruitdaily.com. And uh, yeah, that's what I have to tell you about the newsletter. And thank you, Anne, for putting it together. It is a wonderful, wonderful repository of stuff people are doing that is cool. Uh, right, so next up is the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. So our beloved software, Adabot, um, downloads a bunch of statistics over a one-week period and then we review them. And of course, I also always want to note that, uh, you know, it's not exactly 24 hour basis. So sometimes something slips through the cracks. And if we miss acknowledging you, I apologize, but uh, we try to catch most people. So um, I will do the overall statistics and then we'll pass it around a little to different folks to read the sections. Uh, so overall, we had 12 pull requests merged from seven authors. And uh, besides kind of the core people, we had Roa Code, D. Cooper Dalrymple, C. Darius, Glow Digit, Mikey Schuyler, and Laura Jackick uh, contributing pull requests that we were able to incorporate. So thank you to all those authors. And we had three reviewers, uh, which was Scott, Dan, and myself. Issues wise, we saw a slight rise in issues with 15 issues closed and 17 issues opened by 14 people. And I just want to thank everybody who uh, was doing that work and reporting issues and commenting on issues is also important work. And with that, I will pass it over to Scott, who is going to tell us about the core of CircuitPython. Thanks, Jeff. OK, so this is the uh, core of the CircuitPython firmware that is written in C. Um, so over the last week, we had eight pull requests merged from three different authors, new folks, Glowdigit and Lovrojakic. Um, and then three reviewers, Jeff, Dan, and myself. Uh, we currently have 22 open poll requests, so we're a few under our one-page goal, uh, which is 25. Um, we have, uh, and there were two, I closed the two oldest ones because, and, and made sure that there were issues that corresponded as, as well. I think this is a good approach of like leaving the thread there in case somebody wants to pull it, but not having it as an open PR, just because I think that Open PRs reflects more directly about the health of a project, so I do like to push those um, down and over into the issue landscape. Um, speaking of issues, we had 10 closed issues by three people and 11 open by nine, so we're net up one for a total of 741 open issues. Adafruit funded folks, um, are their work is prioritized and we kind of track that using the milestone uh, system on GitHub. Um, the two main milestones we're targeting right now are 91X, which has five o open issues, and 920, which has two open issues. Ideally, we would work, we would work through those uh, to be able to get 92 out the door. Um, we also, the CESLO says we have seven issues not assigned to milestones, so we'll want to uh, do that uh, search explicitly just so that we can keep uh, tr on top of the triage that we have to do. And that's where we're at for the core. Thank you, Scott. And next up, Fummy Guy will read uh, the section about the libraries and interpret it a little for us. All right, thanks, Jeff. Uh, this section covers all of the CircuitPython libraries, all of which are found on GitHub under names like Adafruit underscore CircuitPython uh, underscore. And these libraries tend to be either driver libraries to help you interface with some piece of hardware or a helper library to help you work on some project at a bit of a higher level. Uh, across all of those libraries this week, we had four pull requests merged by four different authors, uh, which are all newer names uh, to me, but were mentioned uh, before. So thanks to those folks who are perhaps newer or less frequent contributors this week. Uh, we had just one reviewer this week. Thanks to Scott for doing some reviews in library land. Um, the, of the merged pull requests this week, the oldest one was 26 days. The handful of the newest ones were down at one day. That leaves us at the uh, end of the seven days with 38 open pull requests across all these libraries. The oldest one is uh, a draft at 760 days. The newest one is actually at 10 days this week. Um, 
in the past seven days, we had four issues that were closed by three people with five new issues opened up by five people. That leaves us with 884 open issues across the libraries, and there are 102 of those that are labeled as good first issue, uh, which you would be able to find listed over at circuitpython.org slash contributing, which is the website where you should head if you are interested in getting involved with CircuitPython uh, on the development side of things. On that page, you're going to find a list of open PRs uh, and open issues as well. If you click a, a little tab across the top, you can look through that list of open PRs, find something that is interesting to you or that you've got the hardware for, click through to GitHub, uh, take a look at the changes, uh, leave a comment there on GitHub letting us know that you took a look and what you found. If you do have the hardware, go ahead and try it out. And again, let us know in your comment how it went. Um, if you do that a couple of times, get comfortable with the process and want to get leveled up to leave official reviews, we can work on that with you as well. Uh, if you are interested in actually getting your hands dirty on some code, you can click over to the open issues on that circuitpython.org slash contributing page, where you'll find a list of all of the issues listed out open uh, across all these libraries. Uh, and again, you can look through that list, find anything that's interesting to you or something that you've got the hardware for that you feel like you're capable of doing. Click through to GitHub, figure out whatever the issue is, and then uh, make the changes in your little local repository, push it up and make a PR with your changes. Uh, if you need help with that process, we have a guide that covers how to contribute using Git and GitHub. Uh, we also have folks who are around on the Discord to uh, help you out if you are trying to contribute but are having trouble with any step uh, in the process. Um, we want everyone to be able to contribute, so if, you, uh, if that's you and you need some help, please come and say hi on Discord and we'll get you straightened out. Um, uh, on the... Uh, PyPI weekly download stats this week. Uh, we had 177,098 PyPI downloads across those 333 libraries. The top 10 list is here in the notes doc if you'd like to take a look at that. And the uh, new and updated libraries this week over in the community bundle, the new library is M5 Stack PB Hub, and the uh, updated one is the Pixel Buff library, the main bundle. That's what we've got for libraries this week. Thanks. Thank you, Tim. I'm a little curious what a PB hub is. I'm thinking of the lead element, but I'm guessing it's something else. But at any rate, uh, we will go back to Scott to tell us about the Blinka section because Melissa is not here today. You know, I looked at that, what the PB hub was, and I can't remember what it was. Yeah, you approved that PR. I, I did. <laughs> <laughs> and I even, I did look at the board. I think it's just like analog inputs and stuff. <laughs> All right. I don't know. It's you know some extent, some expansion like board for the M5 stack, nice. where it's just doing the like initialization for you for stuff. Um, anyway, so Blinka is the uh, compatibility layer that brings the CircuitPython hardware API to other platforms, including single board computers like the Raspberry Pi and MicroPython. Um, in Blinka land this week, uh, not a ton. Um, we had zero pull requests merged. We have five open pull requests across the different uh, repos. We had one closed issue by one person and one open by another. So we're net, uh, net zero uh, for a, a total of 106 open issues. Um, even though the dev work didn't happen a lot this week, uh, we continue to have downloads. So uh, PyPI downloads in the last week was 14,008. Pi wheel download, Pi wheels downloads in the last month were eighteen thousand four hundred forty-one, and the current uh, count for supported boards is one hundred and forty-six. All right, and there's a picture of the PB hub in the in the text chat. So yeah, it looks like analog, analog I/O. Yeah. So anyway. Uh, that finishes up the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. And if I don't get too distracted, we will go straight over to Hug Reports. Hug Reports is a chance to highlight folks in the CircuitPython community and beyond for doing awesome things. I'll start, and then we'll go down the list alphabetically to give everybody a chance to participate. And if you're text only or are missing the meeting, I'll read your notes when I get to them in the list. So I will start and then go on to Dan. And I have a group hug, as well as a hug for Scott for reviewing my uh, P pull request related to adding support for the RP2350 microcontroller, specifically the new features in the PIO peripheral. All right, Dan, you're up, and we'll follow with Tim, foamy guy. All right, thanks. Um, thanks to Snaggy MakerCat for helping all kinds of people with all kinds of problems in Discord. Uh, thank you very much. Really helpful. 
and thanks to Scott for fixing a bunch of bugs, a lot of it in one PR, in one fell swoop. Uh, that's great. Like moving us really along toward nine to zero. Okay. Thank you. Next is Foamy Guy. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, for me this week, thanks to Tyeth for trying out the serial plotter uh, in the web IDE, uh, as well as actually trying it on the device itself with uh, web workflow using a custom build to point over to the beta version uh, and sharing with me how to do that. Um, thanks to Dan for reviewing a PR in the library screenshot tool uh, that unblocks a few other fixes I've been working on. Thanks to Maker Melissa for reviewing a uh, PR over on the web IDE last week for me. And uh, thanks to uh, everyone here, Group Hug, uh, just uh, for being awesome in this community. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Next, I've got a couple of folks who I'll read the notes for. Mark, also known as Gambler, writes, A hug to everyone who has provided me with positive feedback and ideas on the audio effects during, during show and tell and on the issues, especially Toddbot, Tanute, and D. Cooper Dalrymple. Following that, um, and Scott, you're on deck. Uh, I have some notes from Retired Wizard who writes, A hug to Deshapu for helping me understand how settings.toml parameters are read and leading me to what might be a simple solution to a board variant problem, as well as one for all the Adafruit folks for continuing to push CircuitPython in new and exciting directions, for all the streaming content, and for always jumping to answer questions and solve problems via Discord, the forums, and GitHub channels. And uh, I, I want to add a little to what Retired Wizard says. A lot of these folks helping you on, on Discord forum and GitHub are just community members. They're awesome community members and thanks to each and every one of them. But uh, now we'll hear from Scott before I round it out with some uh, other notes from Toddbot. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, hug to Gambler for working on an audio effects API. It's very cool to see Synthio evolve and the audio stuff evolve into cooler things. Uh, hug to Jeff, uh, you Jeff, for working on all the new PIO details. There's a lot in there and it's kind of just thrown in there. <laughs> so thank you for for getting the details, uh, working on the details there. And then a hug to the MicroPython folks, Damien, Jim, and Gus for taking time. Uh, we met with them last week just to, to share what we're working on and, and, and coordinate. So thanks to them for taking their time for that. Thank you, Scott. All right, last I have notes from Toddbot, who writes a hug to Mark Gambler for work on audio effects, a hug to Dan H for all the RP2350 E9 work across multiple repos, one for D. Cooper Dalrymple for neat new synth related libraries. And finally, one for Snakey Maker Cat for being so patient and helping on the Discord. And that wraps it up for Hug Reports. Well, you saw how Hug Reports went. Status updates is in the same format, but what we would like to talk about is what you've been up to since your last meeting and what you hope to get up to in the near future, such as over the next week. And I will start, and once again, we'll go through the notes document in the order that we've got here. So uh, on deck is Dan. So my main work has been on the two PRs to add RP2350 features um, to PIO. So what that consists of is new features within the PIO assembly language. There are a number of new instructions or instructions with um, new variants that only exist on the new chip. There are new directives, so there's a lot of parsing something and making sense of it and just storing information. And then that information gets sent over to CircuitPython, implemented in C, and it has a few new things that it has to know about. And so that's why there's two different pull requests for that. It's in two different GitHub repos. Uh, so anyway, that's in the home stretch. Scott left some very helpful review comments, fixed some bugs, made things just generally tidier, and we're getting close to the finish line. So uh, while I'm finishing that up, the other thing I'm doing is going through all the built-in modules and testing them out on my Pico 2 board. And I've been uh, just kind of making a list of, of all my findings. The, I, I wrote no surprises yet, but actually in working on the, um, I think it was the memory map module that lets you directly access peripherals. There's an example there for the RP2040. The example has a bug, but also the example doesn't work on the 2350 because the chips are different enough that the like the IO register 32-bit addresses are a little different. So um, I'll put in a pull request soon to fix the example so that it works on the 2040 
and note that it's different on the 2350, although I won't expand on that. Um, you kind of got to go read the data sheet and figure out some hexadecimal numbers, and it's not it's not rocket science, but uh, you, you're kind of on your own to do that. And at some point, it would be nice if somebody did like a playground note that showed some more of this and uh, some convenience modules that let you access these hexadecimal numbers, but that's a whole, whole different thing. Uh, the good news is uh, most of the stuff I tested, I squared C, SPI, display IO on a TFT as well as on an OLED was all working. Basics of keyboard matrix uh, and keypad were working, although some keypads might uh, be affected by this E9 erratum. Um, so anyway, continuing with that, I'm going to get into some more display types, I'm going to get into audio, and I also uh, owe a belated hug report to Liz because she is also writing Adafruit's guide for the Pico 2, and she is going through many of these same items, so we've kind of got two people verifying these things, and she is bound to find something that I just overlook, and that is great. So thank you in advance for that, and thank you for going through the work. Anyway, after all that mouthful, the other thing I've been up to for a project of my own was creating a PIO program that can talk to PS2 keyboards, and that's for a project of my own that is going to ultimately be in the Pico SDK and written in C, but I also want to take that code and use it to implement the PS2 IO module within CircuitPython for the RP2040 and RP2350, which we don't have yet. So uh, those two, those last two items, the checkout of the 2350 Pico 2 functionality and the PS2 IO, I will be working on both of those in some measure over the next week. And um, that seems like a lot, so I'm going to hand it over to Dan, and then uh, Tim is after that. Okay, thanks. All right, so uh, mainly I finished the, ver the merge from MicroPython version 1.23. Um, Scott had noticed one problem, but uh, it should be merged really shortly. There won't be... Uh, this is not really user-facing merge. It's a lot of internal stuff. I don't think you'll see any significant differences due to this merge, but it helps us keep up uh, with uh, the changes in MicroPython. Uh, one issue that I know about is that uh, native code support that is asking MPYs to be compiled into um, machine code for the machine that you're running on, for the chip that you're running on, that appears to be broken. The tests are turned off. The only board I know of that uses that is the Winter Bloom Sol. All right. I mean, it's that's specifically turned on in the board definition, is what I mean. So other people might do this. So uh, I turned this off in the interest of expediency because I was debugging it and it was very far. It was, I spent a lot of time on it and it was not a blocker from my point of view. So I'll let Thea Codes know because she's the one who's the, the designer and seller of that board. But we hope to fix this eventually, and I've documented that as an issue. I also wrote some documentation about the RP2350 uh, E9 errata uh, in the read the docs uh, for digital in out, and I'll do it, I'll cross reference that in PIO and key, keypad too, also. And then I'll just go back to fixing bugs for 9.2.0 so we can get that out as soon as possible. Okay. All right. Uh, all right. So next up we have Tim, and then I'll read uh, notes from Mark. All right. Thank you. Um, last week I wrote up a guide for a cardboard game that I worked on a while back called Blinka Says, um, and that guide was uh, published, so you can check that out on Learn System if you're interested. Um, I also wrapped up the implementation of the serial plotter inside the web IDE last week, which is um, also merged and now live on the beta version. If anyone wants to try that out, I'm happy to get feedback. Um, I, over this past weekend, saw an issue that went by um, that was marked as long-term, but looked like something that was kind of just at the bounds of my knowledge, which is always a good kind of thing to try and learn with. Um, so I took a try at it and managed to make it uh, work successfully, which is adding a confirmation in the web workflow when you are uploading a folder. Um, if you would try to click to a different page or refresh the page, 
or close the tab, it would not warn you like some uh, websites do these days will warn you if it's trying to work on something that will uh, be unsaved. So um, now there's a, a PR open that has a little warning for that and a, a fix for a, a somewhat related issue for when you click into a folder. Uh, when you're looking at the web workflow, you can list out all the files on the device. When you click into a folder, technically it's not loading a new page. Uh, but it was breaking the uh, the upload if it was in the process. And so there's a fix for that as well. Now you can actually click into different folders and the upload will just continue. Um, beyond that, the last couple of days and into today, I've been working on some improvements and fixes to the screenshot utility. This gets used uh, mostly for learn guides to uh, put pictures inside the learn guide of what files will be uh, visible or, or necessary files, I should say, will be visible uh, on the drive when you copy stuff in. So far, the changes I've done, I fixed an issue that caused uh, the SD card folder to get kind of overlaid in front of or on top of one of the libraries in some cases. That was tied to the settings.toml um, not being calculated correctly, the distance, how far down it needs to go. Um, so that's fixed now uh, in a PR. I uh, did another one, which was a different issue on that repo. If your uh, project actually contained your own uh, lib folder with your own libraries in it. Um, not necessarily like libraries from the bundle, but just custom libraries for your project. Um, that was ending up resulting in a duplicated lib folder in the screenshot, which doesn't make much sense because that's not how file explorers work. So that's fixed now. It will take all the contents from your custom one and put it inside the existing one with all the dependencies that are found. Uh, and then a couple more. I. Uh, updated it to include libraries from the community bundle. Uh, while I was working on that uh, guide mentioned before, that guide uses a community bundle library, and I noticed it was excluded from the screenshot. Um, so I've been um, going through and updating that to work with community bundle guides as well. Uh, and then lastly, I did a bunch of updates into actions and pre-commit config and stuff to update versions of stuff which had fallen uh, a bit out of date to get everything running in a newer environment. Uh, and that's what I've been up to. Thanks. Have you verified that the uh, zip that Learn generates actually includes the thing from the um, community bundle, if this is a Learn system guide? Uh, it does. Yeah, yeah, the project bundle zip. Oh, OK. Yeah. I yep. I erroneously thought that it didn't include community bundle files. That's, that's information. Thank you for that. Yeah. All right. Next, I'll read notes from Mark. And then after that, Scott will get to round out this section. So Mark writes, uh, the plan is to get a draft audio effects PR out this week so others can start looking at it. Longer term plan is to write a few effects as templates and write a playground note on how others can add their own. All right, play us out, Scott. Okay, so uh, early last week I got ESP32 P4 support merged into main. Uh, but please note this does not have tiny USB support, so it won't show up as a drive. Um, it works over the USB, uh, the external USB to serial converter. Um, and then after that, I did a number of fixes for 9.2. Uh, I fixed NRF reset in the UF2. It was being done through the soft device, but if the soft device was off, it didn't work. It returned an error and we didn't check it. Um, so now if it returns an error, it will set it without the soft device. Um, and then I was looking at some issues on the ESP32C6 that Liz had found, I think, um, with code.circuitpython.org wasn't working, and it was kind of a combination of three issues. Um, it ended up safe moding because it was running out of memory, and this was due to memory leaks uh, with the BLE workflow. Um, it allocates memory on startup and then does not delete it when it gets stopped. Uh, which causes you to leak memory, which is, uh, I'm a little, little uh, ashamed about that work of mine. <laughs> like, if your file has port malloc, but it doesn't have port free, you're probably doing it wrong. Uh, so I fixed that. Um, I also fixed a bug where uh, that code is saying if GC alloc possible, which is like testing if the VM heap is active, uh, that code wasn't correct either, because when you stop the VM heap, uh, you, you clear state that is not not what Alec Possible is checking. Uh, so I fixed that as well. That was actually causing uh, VM allocations when the VM wasn't running, uh, which is a little weird um, and not right either. And then lastly, uh, this was all kind of like sped up by the fact that um, this the code.circuitpython.org had trouble connecting to the C6. 
And the reason that is is that um, the USB J to JTAG serial stuff uh, for the native onboard converter uh, wasn't clearing its input buffer when it received a control C. Um, other serial sources do do this, but the USB serial one wasn't. Um, and because it wasn't, uh, when the control C was being processed, there was already another character, the control D that happened before, before it, um, would cause it to skip straight to the REPL, and it did not print the press any, uh, press any button to enter the REPL message that the, the JavaScript on code.circuitpath.org was looking for. So uh, that's all fixed up. I did look for other places that weren't doing that, so I added it in more places than just that. Um, I disabled Touch I.O. on the RP2350 because it's broken due to the errata. And I also enabled Pico DVI for all RP2350s by default uh, because uh, it doesn't take as much RAM when it's not running as the, as the other one does. So um, that means that Pico 2 has Pico DVI on it now too. My goal for last week was to get to Circuit Matter, which I did on Friday, and I'm working on replying to a read attribute request, which happens at the interaction and data model layers, uh, which is where kind of like the I want to be a light bulb thing happens as well. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping to be a light bulb in the next week or two or three, I guess, um, before I turn into a dad times two. So that's it for me. All right, thank you, Scott. That rounds up status updates, rounds out status updates. And um, we don't have any topics for in the weeds, so I will go ahead and wrap up the meeting. Thank you to everybody who attended. This has been the CircuitPython weekly meeting for September 16th, 2024. Uh, if you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython and those of us who work on CircuitPython, consider purchasing from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. The video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit, and the podcast will be available on major podcast services. It will also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. Visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe. The next meeting will be held next Monday as usual at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. And remember, at the top of the notes document, there is a link to the schedule that you can view online or add to your favorite calendar app. Um, and apparently I've said the wrong number, Monday, September 23rd, 2024. I'm not sure what I said, but somebody just modified the document right there. All right, getting back on track. This meeting is held on the Adafruit Discord, which you can join at any time by going to adafru.it slash discord. If you want to participate in the meeting by speaking, or if you want to be notified about any changes to the time or day, you can ask to be added to the CircuitPythonistas role on Discord. You'll just get uh, two or three pings a week about the meeting. And uh, with that, I just want to say we hope to see you all next week. Thank you, everybody.